Now I got it. Okay. Um, my name is Jerry Rawls. I'm from Los Altos, California. Um, this summer there was a report that came out. It was about. It was done by. Um, it, it was in some journal of astrophysics or astronomy. Of uh, 23 physicists studied the irradiance of the sun and its effect on Earth's temperature, and they tried to do a balance between you know, Earth temperature and, and the variations and the irradiance from the sun, and they had pretty good data on these data sets for irradiance, and, and they used the best temperature data that they could find, and what they concluded from that was that the sun was the driver of all temperature change, virtually all, and, and, and any small increases in temperature that we'd seen on the Earth, and there was no, almost no measurable human effect. What do, you, what do you say about that? I mean, these guys said it was in a peer-reviewed journal of astronomy. All right, um, in answer to that, I notice our good friend and colleague, Willie Soon, sitting in the front row, and uh, perhaps he might take a crack at it. Where do you get the microphone, Willie? Of course. Excellent question. Uh, the check will come in later. Uh, we, we, I will actually speak about this in the afternoon session, so please come, right? Invite all your friends and invite your kids. Everybody come and fill the room just to show them that we got the crowd. So we will talk about that in 4.45, yeah. I'll explain all of it in detail, a lot more, of course. I'll... Which conclusion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you see, that's, no, no, that, that's right. I do not want to preach to the choir. I only want to show the data and let you decide. I will show you the, the data on how IPCC can hoodwink everybody for almost 30, 40 years, right? And show you that we can actually show how they reach the conclusion. But you consider the, the assumption that they make in the data that they wanted, like the one that Anthony was showing you, the temperature that showed this curve. We can reproduce that 100%. And then we show you another curve that uh, Anthony Ward is asking everybody to do. Why don't we just get rid of all the bad data, like the urban data? I mean, you cannot imagine something so simple and has not been done, but I have done it in 2015. Of course, now we repeat it again in this paper in 2021. <laughs> they got really mad, by the way. This paper is now downloaded 20,000 20, times, so they got really angry you now because everybody started to read this paper. So I hope people will read more about this. And then we show this, this one that showed the no, no urban data. It's actually showing some sort of oscillatory behavior. And we know how to fit this one. All explained by the sun, that's right. But that's okay, a, that's so a the answer is come this afternoon to hear his presentation. But basically, those scientists who said the sun is the most important were absolutely correct. Let's have another question, if we can. Yeah, real quick. My name is Frank from Prescott, Arizona. Um, you Don't forget to tell us your name. Frank. Oh, all right. Um, from Prescott, Arizona. Um, you, you showed the, the graph that showed the green line, the difference between zero C CO2 and 400. Yes. Did Happer and Weingarten show the difference between like 350 CO2 versus the current level? Yeah, they did a whole bunch of series of calculations. That's a great thing. They didn't take a uh, billion dollars per model run. It was cheap. And so they did it for CO2 of, I think, like uh, 50 and 100 parts per million and 200 and everything. And by golly, you could see exactly what you were expecting, that sort of logarithmic decrease in the importance of CO2 as it got greater and greater. But frankly, almost the whole effect of CO2, at least a big effect of it, comes in the first 50 or 100 parts per million. Uh, I'm Bob Benson from San Carlos, California. Uh, if if you were make if you were had a colleague from IPPC or IPCC sitting on the dais, what would be their counter argument to the data you showed on the spectral analysis? What would they what would they say to debunk the statements that you made? Uh, let's see if um, uh, Cork Hayden can take a shot at that question. Well, I guess the best description would be it'd be like um, they'd be shaking a feather pillow in your face. Um, I, how can you get around the laws of physics? They can't. So they have to be evasive. Shake a feather, feather pillow in your face. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay, here's, here's hey, next. Good afternoon. My name is Michael. I'm from New Hampshire. What you described in your paper is the concept of CO2 saturation. Is there, is anybody on the panel able to provide a layman's description that the average person could use to understand the concept of CO2 saturation? Yeah, I'd like to David, say, how about you? Would you like to, oh, Clark I'll, again. Okay. I'll say something about that. Um, depending upon what the wavelength is in, in the IR spectrum, there's some wavelengths in the IR spectrum uh, where the IR would not travel so much as a meter without being absorbed. And there are some where there are some wavelengths where the IR can travel many kilometers without being absorbed. It's a com very complicated sort of a function. But the long and short of it is that uh, during, uh, in the middle part of the spectrum, uh, the absorption is so great that uh, by the time you've got 50 to 100 uh, parts per million, you have absorbed uh, almost as much as you can. But now, now let, me, let me explain a little bit, uh, and Will Happer would be a lot better about this. But one of the laws of physics is that the photons are not conserved. Energy is conserved, but the number. So don't think of a molecule as absorbing IR and re-radiating IR, because it's not the same IR, and something else can happen, and that is that the, you absorb some IR, now the molecule has some internal energy. It can get rid of that energy by colliding with other molecules, primarily nitrogen and oxygen, and just contributing to general temperature increase. Alternatively, there can be collisions between other molecules and the CO2, which can excite the CO2 to cause radiation. And in fact, that is what happens at, at high altitude. So it becomes a very, very complicated thing. It involves uh, what we lovingly call sadistical mechanics. That's a humorous thing. Um, it, 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 is, it, is a, it is a very complicated thing, but, but uh, just imagine that the IR at, uh, at around 15 microns just doesn't get anywhere. It gets kind of scattered around and that kind of stuff. A lot of that radiates back to the surface. But uh, the long and short of it is that uh, that part of the spectrum gets absorbed uh, into the atmosphere and translated into thermal energy. Uh, and so, so it, it, it's, a, it's done almost all it can do in that particular radiation range um, by the time you get to, let's say, 100 uh, uh, parts per million. Now, I actually have a graph that I made from the uh, from the Happer and Weingarten paper, which looks a little bit like this. Picture a graph. Okay? This is the absorption in watts per square meter. This is the concentration uh, going from zero to about 400 or 800, whatever you want. The curve starts at zero, comes up like this, and then bends over like that. It doesn't get completely flat, but the, the upshot of it is that that upper part of it can be approximated by that logarithmic formula that, was, uh, that I presented in there that I didn't pay much attention to. I just gave the number 3.7 watts per square meter for doubling. See? Hey, answer? another question. Is somebody way in the back there? Me first. Over here. Me first. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. 
Rick Worma, also from New Hampshire. I um, uh, microphone on. thought I knew what um, the greenhouse warming potential definition was from the, your presentation. I think I've forgotten some of the parts of it. Is it a combination of both how much um, infrared is absorbed by the gas multiplied by the number of years of persistence in the atmosphere, or is it something else? Um, I think I can tell you a little about that myself. It was back in AR4 when they uh, uh, presented, I think it was on pages 210 to 214, was sort of the origin of this thing. And what they basically did was they formed a ratio of the effect of CH4, for example, or any of the fluorocarbons, over, that is a ratio, a numerator there, and the denominator was the carbon dioxide number, which already at 400 parts per million was remarkably flat curve. Well, the derivative of a remarkably flat curve is extremely close to zero, and now you've got a ratio of a finite number to an incredibly small number, and what happens when you divide by something very near zero? You balloon it up, the answer to a great big number. So in just a couple of years, the calculated number for methane went from something like 21 up to 28 and then to 30, not because of anything real, but because that denominator was getting closer and closer to zero as CO2 went from 390 parts per million to 400 to 412. And it shows you the foolishness of using numbers like that. Because everybody knows you can't divide by zero, and when you divide by something close to zero, you're going to get a huge number. And that's the problem with the global warming potential number. That's right got anybody Over here. else? I have the microphone. Oh, go ahead. Um, Patrick Basher from New York. I just wanted to elaborate. There was a question about how do you explain this in layman's terms. And uh, I thought I would just share very quickly an explanation that Will Happer himself has actually given. And the way he explains the uh, saturation of CO2 is, imagine a barn that's painted white and you want to change it to red. So you put a color red paint on it, which is a CO2, and a little bit shows through. You put a second coat on, and maybe a tiny bit more of the white still shows through. By the time you put that third coat of red on, it doesn't make any difference. It's, and you could put 10 coats of, rain, of red paint on, it still won't make a difference because all the white has been blocked out. And so the extra CO2 uh, really isn't adding a lot because there's already enough to absorb within those spectral lines. And so it's the same effect. And that's kind of the layman uh, explanation that I heard Dr. Happer actually give that registered in my mind. So I just thought I would share that. Okay. Um, now, as I said before, Ken Hapala has some closing remarks. And, and to keep the schedule on time, we do want to finish by one. So I'm going to call on Ken at this time to come up with that. Thank you. I hope I'm not uh, interrupting someone's ho planned questions, because I preferred the questions rather than talk speaking again. Uh, what is the alternative to fossil fuels? Our country, in effect, has declared a war on fossil fuels. At least Washington has. What is the alternative? They say wind and solar. The Bonneville Power Authority in, along the Columbia River has extensive wind and solar power. It's backed up by hydropower from uh, the Columbia River. Uh, you have about a 10 uh, megawatts, excuse me, 1,000 uh, megawatts, excuse me, 3,000 megawatts of wind and solar backed up by about seven times more uh, hydropower. I just took a few graphs from uh, the, put out by the Bonneville uh, Power Authority showing the changes in wind power over 24 hours, well this is one week, and you see lots of zeros. This is actual data 
that is being generated in, a, in an area where the wind's supposed to burn or uh, blow all the time. If we look at the next graph, you'll see, and this is recent, you'd see it going up to over, uh, and I can't quite read it, uh, 20,000 megawatts, or 2,000 megawatts, and then dropping back down to zero. Now, nobody has been able to figure out how you make it constant. We t <laughs> I certainly can't. And I've looked at numerous way attempts to do so. Uh, there, was, there was an experiment on uh, the Canary Islands where you had pumped hydro storage to make uh, the supply of electricity constant. You had another one on King Island off of Tasmania, which used a combination of things to try to make the supply of wind power, electricity from wind power constant. They both failed miserably. Nobody t talks about the costs and why, because the wind fails often. Now, we talk about a high tech solution. Well, it, let's look at one high tech manufacturing. To manufacture a computer chip, draw the patterns on the chip on a silicon wafer that creates the capabilities of the computer chip. Just to do that requires an electricity constant for two weeks to eight weeks. That, you need constant electricity to do it. You have one glitch and you lose your entire production line. And that's high-tech manufacturing. We don't have a high-tech solution to provide high-tech manufacturing. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of you for coming here and, and participating in this session. And uh, I think next you get to enjoy lunch and uh, we'll have an after dinner speaker after lunch. And then there'll be sessions again in this room this afternoon on the science track. Thank you for coming. <laughs>